you know, six months in the game, you're just thinking about one thing. How do I get more views? It's a dangerous game. For me, that's the fitness. Social media has given platform to people, frankly, who don't deserve it. Where they speak without knowing what they're talking about, they cause a very, very big problem. Assalamu alaikum viewers and listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Side by Side. I'm your host, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman. Generalization is the beginning of racism. Part of our role is to not feed the narrative. The world is seemingly becoming a very, very difficult place for Muslims. Muslim sisters, women taking part in dawah in online space. I'm going to give you my honest opinion here, and it may be controversial. For me, the most important thing is, what is your guideline? If those people were white people from any country, they would be out crying. They would be one more thing. It's, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, and it's happening. I think one weak link in the chain of your ancestors breaks the strength of Islam. Assalamu alaikum viewers and listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Side by Side. I'm your host, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman. Our guest today is brother Musa Adnan, who is a influential online figure who is heavily involved in dawah scene. In our today's conversation, we will explore so many topics. There is so much to talk about. So what I will do, I will go straight into this episode and let you guys discover for yourself. However, before we begin, ladies and gentlemen, supporters and well wishers, please do consider subscribing to our channel on the platform you are tuned into because honestly, it is your subscription that's like a dose of motivation for us to keep doing what we're doing episode after episode. And inshallah, the whole community will benefit from it. The Muslim community will benefit from it. The humanity will benefit from it. So I am counting on you for this support. And I cannot begin this episode without thanking our sponsors, Get Micro, for facilitating this conversation. Without any further ado, Brother Musa Adnan. Brother Musa, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for coming in. It's my pleasure. You're very early, mashallah. I was very early. No, inshallah. <laughs> actually, you were on time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. But you came earlier. Yeah. Um, Jazakallah for coming in. Um, okay. And um, we've been trying to get this going for, for a while now. Yeah. So yeah. it's a pleasure having you. Pleasure to be here. Um, let's kick things off with something. Uh, it's a bit of a personal question. What is okay. your biggest fear? Oh, my God. What's my biggest fear? I mean... I, I think a lot of people, if you ask them this question, they'll give you the cliche answer or, you know, I'm, I'm scared to come on Yawm al Qiyama and there's yeah. nothing there, etc. I think for me, I don't know if I should call it my biggest fear. I don't know if I'm diverting from the question. But I think I have a lot of personal expectations in my head of myself. And maybe this is something a lot of people don't talk about. But for me, it's disappointing myself, really. Um... For me, my expectations within them is being a good Muslim. So for me, that's already you know an expectation I have of myself. But I have other expectations, and me failing, uh, or, or or you know coming short of those expectations, is a fear I have. Wow. Which which I which I battle with every day. Share some of those expectations apart from being a Muslim. I think. I think for me, a lot of the expectations online, uh, being involved in the da'wah, um, are to do with uh, myself, forwarding myself in terms of self-development, self really. So I'm very, very critical of myself in how much studies I'm doing, how much I'm reading. I need to read more. I'm a human being, just like anyone else. You know, we're all human beings. We're all affected by the same things, our mobile phones, being addicted to our mobile phones, social media. Um, so I think some of those things for me are my priorities. And for me, my priorities are often to do, they're always linked to my work, which is, uh, you know, being involved in online polemics, da'wah, etc. So, yeah. yeah. How do you avoid distraction? Because, mashallah, you've got a... Uh, mm -hmm. Good following on on Instagram and across um, all the other channels, mm. and I'm Indeed, sure yeah. it's it's. It, it, I know it happens. It happens to me. It happens to everyone with with yeah. the, with the, with the following. Yeah. How do you avoid fitna? 
It's very difficult, brother, to be honest with you. It's very difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult for you to avoid fitna, especially uh, in the social media world, to be honest with you. When you say fit, you know, when let's just address the elephant in the room. Yeah, right? yeah. When you say fitna, there's only I'm one thing. I'm talking about DMs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So you were talking about that. <laughs> when, when people say fitna, usually what, they, what they're thinking of is women and stuff like that. For me, I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, that stuff is not, alhamdulillah, it's not a problem for me like that. I'll be very honest with you. I'm not saying that of humility or to try and look good. Um, but for me, the fitna is other things. I'll be honest with you. For me, the fitna is the addiction side of things. Spending too long on social media, more than you should. Uh, checking, constantly checking. This is this is how it is. Maybe you do the same thing. Maybe you struggle the, with the same the, thing. The, the KPIs are so, like, they've, they've yeah. made it so addictive. Like, when you post a video, you're just checking again Constantly and again. checking yeah. your, uh, oh, how's this video doing? Oh, what do I need to improve on? What's this? What's that? And it's dangerous, bro. It's very dangerous because it takes before a toll you, know, on you you start, everyone starts social media with a beautiful, pure, white image. You know, white goals, you know, a very pure goal. And then before you know it, you know, six months in the game, you're just thinking about one thing. How do I get more views? How do I get out there more? How do I, uh, you know, so it's it's a dangerous game. For me, that's the fitna. That's the real fitna. Because that fitna, I'll be honest with you. Okay, fine, a woman and this and that. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, okay, you, you, you know, that's one thing. Yeah. That's one side of the coin. Yeah. But I think an even bigger fitna for the soul, for a person's insights, for a person's soul, is the, this issue of, of clout chasing, you know, and there's a balance because no one, you know, you're doing your podcast. No one, you, 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 you want to invite people. You want to have discussions that people want to watch, right? Yeah. So there's a dilemma here. Absolutely. Me, when I'm doing my YouTube videos, I want people to watch my YouTube videos. Yes, hundred percent, undoubtedly. No one is gonna say I don't want anyone to see this. Okay, and people may, you know, sugarcoat these things and say, oh, I'm putting this online to benefit people. Yeah, but when you say I want to benefit people, you, you how many people? As many as possible, right? So to an extent, everyone is clout chasing, but it's balancing that with why are you doing it? Are you trying to just act like you're better than other people? You know, some people when you meet them, and I've experienced this myself, when you meet people, some people uh, that you meet who are really famous on social media, etc., they come across very arrogant people. They're very up themselves. And others are humble. So you can see who's been really, really heavily affected, you know, by the social media game. So I think that's the biggest fit now, personally. Okay. You know. That's good. Um, okay. Mashallah. So how, I know your father is, is quite prominent on, on yeah. the online uh, space as well. Yeah. Did you get inspired by him or did he get inspired by you? Who got inspired by who? <laughs> it's funny because when, when people speak about my father, to this day, by the way, yeah, because we've mentioned this so many times, made so many videos, but you don't know, like people get to know you through different ways, right? Yeah. So to this day, when I mention who my father is, people get very, very shocked. Because subhanAllah, it's not usually the case, actually, with, with people who are related on social media. Like, for example, you, you, you appear with your brothers on social yeah, media, yeah. right? So people know. They are yeah. siblings, yeah. right? I'm sure it's much rarer for you yeah. to come across this, right? For me, people know who my father is separate to me. So they find out who I am through one way, and they find out who my father is through one way. And then when they make their connection, it's like, <laughs> yeah. what's going on, right? Uh, but no, uh, f I was inspired by my father. My father was, uh, he started giving da'wah, and he was involved with organizations like Aira. Oh, mashallah, doing amazing work, you know, giving da'wah to non-Muslims. They focus specifically on non-Muslims. They're in many, many countries around the world. So he started off with them. I mean, he started off way before that in Speaker's Corner, when Speaker's Corner was much less of a of a joke, uh, you know, sorry to say, that, that mm. as it, uh, than it is now. Uh, of course, a lot of the brothers, they go there, they still try and benefit and stuff like that. It's a good thing to do. But he started off a long time ago. And yeah, I saw him growing up as a, as a young child. And I was definitely inspired. You are a product of your environment. So that was my environment. I would go along with him to many of the lectures he would give and deliver in different universities. And yeah, I mean, I guess, I think a lot of it was subconscious as well. A lot of it was subconscious. I don't, I don't know if I ever sat down and thought, oh, my dad is doing this. I would like to do this. I think a lot of it happened very naturally, yeah. very subconsciously. 
Um, I didn't intend for this. I tried to do other things actually, go into business and other things and stuff like that. But I ended up here. So, <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah. So the social media side of things yes. um, for you, for your father. Uh, 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 who, who, who started first? Was he, it him? Um, I think we started at similar times because because of social. It's funny, right? But, Do you guys ever compare? Yeah. Like, you know who's got more views? Do you, do you know what? It, it happens. You know, it happens. <laughs> it happen, It'll naturally happen. It'll naturally happen. Subhanallah. But um, but my father, I, I took a hiatus of social media. I took a, a long break uh, for the purpose of studying Islam and and going further with my Islamic studies and stuff like that. And I don't regret that. But my father was the main force in telling me to come back on social media. Like you have to come back and you have to be active. So um, a lot of a lot of parents uh, and a lot of people generally are very skeptical of social media. My father isn't. So with me, my father preceded me in everything. I, w- I wouldn't say I, I I passed him in anything. He preceded me in all of those things. And yeah, I mean, um, he's actually one of the reasons why I'm active on social media. Actually, I should I should say that he is one of the reasons why I'm. Because when I even become demotivated, he tells me, "No, you have to do more." Right? When I give him excuses. Some of the excuses I would mention previously is, I want to study more, I want to do this more, I want to do that more. Be like, well, you've got all of these, you've got so many clowns on social media who are speaking with, because social media has given platform to people, frankly, who don't deserve it. And I'm not saying I deserve it. Yeah. But I'm saying social media has undoubtedly given a platform to people where they speak without knowing what they're talking about. They speak about Islam without knowing what they're talking about. They speak about politics without knowing what they're talking about and as a result they cause they cause very very big problems and we saw this with the recent UK riots we saw people coming on social media uh, ill-informed misinformed intentionally or unintentionally guiding the masses in a direction which was very detrimental and we saw that with it before us so we see the power of social <clears> media <throat> so because of that I think um, I think it's, it's a big responsibility on people like yourself and myself as well with what we say and what we do on social media, you know. Mashallah. So speakers corner, you said it's <laughs> it's yeah. become a bit of a joke. I think so. I think a lot so. of people go there for content, right? I would still go there, but I th- I think it has become like that. You have to pick your battles, your discussions, you know. What inspired your dad to do what? I mean, obviously, I, w- I wish I could yeah. ask him directly, but did he ever tell you like what inspires and motivates him to do what he does? With my father, I think my, my father was actually a bus driver. He was actually a bus driver many years ago. Mashallah. And um, I say mashallah because I was a toilet cleaner <laughs> at once. Yeah, once subhanallah. Time. I mean, yeah, everyone has their journey. You yeah. know, subhanallah. He wasn't involved in dawah and he didn't even have a an educational background per se. Uh, but he went to university late. Uh, he he done a bachelor's in history, went on to do his masters, and he saw that there were people in 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 speakers' corner. You know, I don't want to mention them because mentioning them would even be you know something that they're not deserving of. But he saw certain individuals in speakers' corner misrepresenting Islam, misrepresenting Islam, and it affected him. It got to him. Um, so one day he went and he challenged. One specific individual. He's an American Christian missionary who's, um, you know, Jay Smith, his name is. Um, and he was spreading a lot of misinformation about Islam, etc. He challenged him. And that was it. That was the beginning of it. He started going regularly. And many, many popular du'at actually started from Speaker's Corner. In fact, most of the people that we have in the da'wah scene in the UK, they, they, they started from Speaker's Corner. They started from Speaker's Corner. And they went on to bigger and better things. So I think that was the beginning. A problem, you know, was the beginning of it. And I mean, when we look at it from a historical perspective, this was the inspiration behind many, many, uh, you know, uh, activists and people who made, whether it be political change, religious change, it was the presence of a massive issue, a massive problem. And, And they came as activists in response to that. I'm currently completing my master's dissertation right now is actually since I came earlier I started working on that and I'm doing it on Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah who was a great scholar who lived uh, you know in the 14th century um, he died 1328 and he was active my, my dissertation is on his activism against the Mongols he was extremely active against the Mongols and what fueled his activism 
what fueled his activ- activism is this issue is 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 he he feared the mongols taking over and if the mongols defeated the mamluks who were ruling over egypt and syria these areas he knew that we, islam would be done in these areas there would be a different version of islam in these areas and the muslims would be in a very very big predicament and if if the mongols defeated uh, you know the mamluks then possibly the area of bilad al-sham that we see today would be very very different would be very very different in its makeup so his activism was warranted and his activism had a lot of benefit that we see uh, the result of it today so the point is the point is that problems bring rise to great men generally speaking problems bring Definitely. rise to great men i agree you know, you know <laughs> In this country or, or in London, we have speakers' corner. Yeah, we do. Do you yeah. think? Do you think there's a re- why did they make this speakers' corner? I always get curious. I mean, the history of speakers' corner is something very, very interesting as well. A lot of people probably think speakers' corner is just something uh, that started last week or you know a few years ago or yeah. something like that. No, some of the greatest minds, you know, and some of the greatest movers, you know, who've had a lot of even political influence. Started from Speaker's Corner. We have individuals like Karl Marx. You know, we have the concept of Marxism and people study it in universities and Western universities and Eastern universities and all over the place. He used to go to Speaker's Corner. So we have many individuals who, you know, who were influential, who went to Speaker's Corner. There is a history behind it. Um, even though now, as I said, you know, the advent of social media. And this is the effect, you know, going back to the social media discussion this is the difference that social media create has created with people. You have something, Speaker's Corner, which its purpose was essentially to provide a place for people to debate, people to have discussions, people to come with, I'm a Muslim, you're a Christian, let's debate. You know, you believe you're 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 from the far left, I'm from the far right, let's debate, right? You believe in this, I believe in that, let's have a discussion, let's have it out. Social media comes and it makes a gimmick of the whole thing. Do you see? Yeah. So this, in this way, unfortunately, social media has changed. Even if if you want to say even academia. So now you have people who pose as academics on social media. They pose as people who have knowledge, and uh, it's it's made a difference to Islamic scholarship, Islamic scholarship, where you know you'd have a lot of depth to even Islamic scholarship. Yeah. You know, historically speaking, the scholars, when we read about them, it's as if we're reading about legends. You know, people find it shocking when they read about the social media people, you know, people who are active on social media. The social media generation finds it shocking when you read about, you know, uh, the kind of people that we read about, right? He memorized this and he done that and he done this, uh, etc. Recently, I was in Bosnia. And I visited some of the mosques in some of the locations and, and I felt so much peace and I felt one with, you know, I'm not trying to become all, you know, Sufi on everyone and stuff <laughs> like that. But I felt one with the earth and everything. And I thought one thought crossed my mind and I made a video about this. No wonder why such people produce such works. No wonder why they were so great, because they didn't have all of the distractions that we have. These distractions have pushed us in a direction and that direction is, it, it, it fuels and it shapes everything we do. SubhanAllah. You know, you have people who study medicine. You know, every career, they study medicine. You'll find they start making social media content and they leave the medicine stuff behind. Their, their, medis- their information, the things that they've learned about medicine now become packaged for social media. Is it a good thing? In some ways it is. In some ways it is. I was speaking with my grandmother yesterday who is a 70-year-old woman. She's a 70-year-old woman last night and she had her phone out and she's showing me, she's saying, you know, my phone, it's so amazing. Look at her perspective. You know, I always uh, listen to Quran on my phone and I always hear reminders and so many things about history. And this is literally what she was mentioning to me. That's one benefit of it. But on the other side, the other side, you know, um, you know, even though information has become so accessible to us, chat GBT, you know, write any question to it. Oh my God. Ask it to explain the philosophy of, uh, you, know, you know, ask it to explain any deep topic to you, the epistemology of this and that and whatnot and logic, and it'll do all of that for you. 
But at the same time, we're living in probably the most ignorant age that humanity has ever seen. Why? So, I mean, I know that you asked me about Speaker's Corner and its history and stuff like that. But I think the point is social media. I want to just focus on how social media has affected everything. So it's affected Speaker's Corner. So Speaker's Corner, one of the reasons why it's become like this is because people come with their cameras now and they're looking for content, they're clip farming, they're looking for clips and stuff like that. And maybe that's what we're doing right now as well. Wow. Right? We're, we're victims. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, so, so look. So it's crazy, right? Well, I always felt like Speaker's Corner was created just to vent frustrations of people who, who are angry about certain topics and go out there and just talk about it and then... I think no, it was it's more, like an outlet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think even your judgment of that is based on what we see now. Yeah. But I think historically speaking, it had much purer or better intentions. Mm. You know, it's, a, it's supposed to be a place where you can come, share ideas, debate ideas, and, you know, come up with some... You know, I mean, I, I went a couple of weeks ago, and alhamdulillah, bifadlillah, I don't, you know, it's not because I'm anyone special... My brother came up to me, I started speaking with him. I realized he's an ex-Muslim, Pakistani guy. I started speaking with him. I spoke with him for an hour or so. Alhamdulillah, he took his shahada, he came back to Islam. And some of the brothers who go regularly to Speaker's Corner, they came up to me, one of the brothers came up to me and he said, oh, I haven't seen a shahada here in so long. I'm like, why is that? And one of the reasons why I think that is, is because nowadays people go there, they don't go there sincerely. Yeah, They go there just to... You know, everyone's got a YouTube channel. We're all looking for clips for ourselves. And in a way, I do believe, and it's difficult, bro. This is really difficult because all of us are victims of this. I'm a victim of this, right? Where if I made a video, and I have made videos like this, if I make a video just talking about something really deep about Islam, why you should pray, why you should, and something deeper, not the usual thing you hear, you know, I'm, I'm going deeper. Maybe I'll bring you some stuff from scholars you've never heard of. And, and if I do that, people don't want to see that. No. They're not interested. To the extent I've sat with some of the brothers, Hijab, Muhammad Hijab, he's a friend of mine and stuff. And, you know, even brothers will remind me, bro, you can't do this anymore. You can't do this. You have to, you know, people will tell you, you've got to play the game, man. And this is the problem now. <laughs> You have to play the game. You could be a graduate from any Islamic university, brother. People don't want to. People don't want to. People want the clips. Mm. They want one minute. They can't sit down for three hours. Attention span has gone down. It's affected so our brains. Much. It's so affected much. our brains. Uh, you know, to the extent even people say it's the younger generation. That's nonsense. That the is, elders are like you know that's equally nonsense. bad. It's that's nonsense. It's not. The, it's not the younger generation. The elders are doing it. The elders are on Facebook all day, yeah. on Instagram all day, you know. So, yeah, man. We are all victims of it. We're all victims. And God knows what's going to happen we're next, all, what platforms are coming next. Yeah, yeah. Ya Allah. Um, Muslim sisters, women taking part in dawah in online space. Great what stuff. What are your thoughts? <laughs> okay, I see you get, you're getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think that I'm going gi- to I'm going to give you my honest opinion here and it may be controversial. No, I okay. mean be honest and but then, yeah. I'm going to give you what I actually think. I think that in the history of Islam um if you look at the history of Islam when you look at the roles of scholars okay scholars have always for some reason at the forefront of things have always been for the most part men. And I know people will respond to this and say, but what about this? And what about her? And what about her? Etc. Okay, that's fine. I understand that they were definitely influential Muslims. Okay. For example, we have the biggest example. Aisha radiallahu anha was the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi And she is responsible for many of the narrations of the Prophet sallallahu that we have today. And if it was not for her, we would not know many of the things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam done in his private personal life, undoubtedly. Okay. So undoubtedly, Muslim females have their place. Okay. Um, and they have their place. Even I would say, I'll say, I do see the benefit of some Muslim women being on social media. However, and this is where the, the but comes in. 
I think that sisters need a lot of guidance, just as brothers do, with regards to what they do on social media. Um, so it's very, it's much easier for people to follow a sister on social media, and that's why you find that. If you look at brothers on social media, even if they're you know knowledgeable and stuff like that, they won't have as many followers. For some reason, this sister, she's got a lot of followers. She's talking about Islam. And you see examples of this. Even if they're in niqab, even, I'm saying even if they're in niqab, why is that the case? I'm sorry to say, like, I'm, we live in a very perverted world and et cetera, whatnot. Some people simply, they like the idea of watching a female talk about things, even if she's in niqab. Now, some people are going to respond and say, okay, what are you talking about, brother? What are hmm. you saying? Oh my God, hmm. she's covered. Why are, you, why are you? Why are you describing her like? This? Yeah, don't. I'm saying don't blame me. I'm saying this is just the reality of it. That when a woman is in niqab and a woman is uh, even if she's even if she's covered, unfortunately, people people's minds, you know, uh, they 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 some people they just attract even to that. Okay. And I think, this, <laughs> I know it's very controversial what I'm saying, but look, I'll be honest with you. I'm just saying what a lot of people think. Okay, I'm saying what a lot of people think. Okay, does that mean they shouldn't be on social media? There are some sisters who are quite influential actually on social media and they don't show their face. Nor, nor do they even appear in niqab. They do lectures and they do talks for sisters. Uh, they don't show their face. They don't appear in, They don't appear like that. And they are very influential. And I think those sisters are needed. I think they are needed. I think that they have a role to play. I think that they do beneficial things. And perhaps perhaps uh, there is a balance to these things, you know. Um, but things have changed, bro. Because even the examples people will bring from the past of influential women, do we, have a, do we ever have a time in history where we had a woman who is sitting, let's say for example, because a lot of people... We'll, we'll push back on what I'm saying right now. But let me just ask a simple question. Can you name me a time where we had a woman sitting in a masjid in front of men, okay, and she is teaching hundreds and thousands of men in front of her and they're just all looking at her. She's teaching hundreds of thousands of men, okay, and they're all just looking straight at her, directly at her, even no. if she's in niqab. They're all looking directly at her. Do we have an example like that? And would ulama of Islam find that problematic? These are questions that I think we need to ask. Okay, I'm not giving a ruling. I'm not even alluding to a ruling, but I'm saying these are questions we need to ask. Because even when we give the example of Aisha radiallahu anha, we know that she taught behind a veil. We know that she was not uh, teaching millions of men. We know that her... Her, her, the image of her was not accessible to the whole dunya, etc., where people are coming. So I think that social media has shifted the balance for us. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a controversial <laughs> issue. These are some of my thoughts on it. <laughs> okay. What Talk do you think? Let me put it back on you. What do you mm. think? And what do you actually think? What do I think? Don't be don't be diplomatic with your answer because um, I wasn't <laughs> diplomatic. Um, if I'm do going I down, think? brother, you're gonna go down with me. <laughs> <laughs> I see how you're doing this. <laughs> what do I think? Um, hey guys, I hope you have been enjoying today's episode of Side by Side with myself, Kazi Shafiq Rahman, and our guest. Musa Adnan. This episode was brought to you by Get Micro, a web design agency that's based in London, who create beautiful websites for entrepreneurs and small and medium-sized businesses for less than 900 pound delivered within 10 days or less if you are looking for a beautifully crafted website to express your products services or your ideas please visit get micro if you have been enjoying our conversation so far please 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 do consider subscribing to our channel on the platform you are tuned into. Your subscription goes such a long way. It's a dose of motivation for us to continue episode after episode. And inshallah with you by our side, we will 
become the number one podcast in our niche. Without any further ado, let's get straight into the show. Look, I think I would put it back on us men. Mm-hmm. Like really, we 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 need to. Obviously, things have changed. The world has yeah. changed. You know, yeah. like for example, um, money has changed. The way we deal with money has changed. Uh, we do online banking nowadays. We're not going back to you know gold standard. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It's just we're too far in. So certain mm-hmm. things we just have to live with. Yeah. But this is at the, the thing. S- yeah. At the same time, we have to also ask ourselves like. What's my intention? Because one of the hadith that we've read when we when I went to Madrasa is Imam Nawi's first hadith was yeah. about intention. In in the man, yeah. So I always ask myself, like, what is my niyat? What is my intention? I want to clarify though. I don't. I, I don't. Here we're not saying I don't believe there should be any effort from sisters online. I'm just saying the way it's done. Yeah. So for example. A sister appearing, showing her face, wearing makeup, dressed up, and she's giving da'wah. We can all see why that's problematic. Yeah. And why that's diddu uh, sharia You know, yeah. why that's against the sharia. Okay. In, in opposition to it. Okay. Okay, let's put a niqab on her now. Okay. And she's covered properly. Um, I, I actually believe that some, some, some scholars of Islam may still have an issue with that. I'm not saying they're right or I agree with that, etc. I actually believe that, I mean, from even speaking with different tulab ilm and even mashayikh and stuff like that, etc. Some of my seniors and stuff like that. I've noticed this. I've actually noticed this. Because this conversation has actually come up. In some of my circles, it's actually come up. And without mentioning names, I remember one of my mashayikh mentioning that, um, that some of the points that I actually mentioned, which is, has something like this ever happened where... This sort because there's there's a thing that we that we learn of in fiqh, which is hukm faron an tasawurihi, that the hukm of something, the ruling on something, is relying upon the way in which you put that thing. One small thing, and I want everyone to understand this. One small thing that you mentioned could change the whole thing. It could go from haram halal, halal haram, right? So now the fact that this woman is on social media and she's showing herself to this many people and this and that, um, I think this is the job of scholars to discuss this and really establish whether or not they should be doing this. But I can see why some people may say that they're not fond of this. But I believe it's needed. And maybe the solution to that is the way some sisters are doing it, which yeah. is they don't show themselves. They do event, they, events, they market those events. Sisters go to those events. And uh, they benefit the sisters. And us brothers, we should really like you know follow Mufti Menko or somebody. I mean, like... brothers. I mean, if you're a brother and you're following, uh, and this is the thing, this is a problematic thing, where you'll actually have brothers following such sisters, okay? Which is quite strange, which is very very strange. And some of these sisters, you'll see, you'll notice that they try and you know push their audience in a certain direction by saying "Salamu alaykum, sisters," like yeah. when they start their videos and yeah, stuff like for that. Sisters. I don't know. It's a yeah. very tough one. Now, obviously, out of, it's out of question. Like you know, yeah. I guess uh, for on this context, yeah, um, sisters going to gym and making gym content. And oh no, that's not even a discussion, brother. What that's about tough, athletes and sports and no. representation of of uh, Muslim women in the mainstream space? I mean, how far should we take it? Like, I don't know, taking part in fights, boxing. How sh- how far should we take these things? Representation. Muslim representation and uh, how far should we take this concept? Because, like, okay, should we have, uh, sorry to say, uh, like, uh, you know, should we have Muslim uh, mo- uh, supermodels? Should we have uh, Muslim musicians? Should we have Muslim porn I think we're getting to Muslim that. I think it's, happen- it's, it's coming you know? to that. So, 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 how far should we take this? Uh, you, you, for, me, for me, the most important thing is, and I believe. What I'm about to say now is very, very simple. But I believe this simple thing is where the crux of our issues, whether it be our marriage issues, social issues, everything stems from this. It is, what is your guideline? Simply asking. Any Muslim watching us, what's your guideline? If your guideline is your feelings, if your guideline is your feelings, your hawa, then your hawa, it's gonna even it's gonna end up taking you to bad places. Your desires, all of us, okay. 
And we see that every single day. We see that in Western society. We see many people who have made their guideline, their desires, what they end up doing. Okay? Your guideline as a Muslim should be Islam. So the real question should be, what is the Islamic correct position on this? What is the actual position? What's the best thing to do? What's the afdal thing to do? What's the best thing to do in this scenario? Okay? And when we talk about, you know, these topics that we're talking about, that's the thing. That's what our goal should be. It should be trying to establish what is the actual correct thing. Okay? Unfortunately, many people don't want to hear that. They no. don't want to hear that. No. They say they're Muslims, and they are Muslims, of course, inshallah, right? But they don't want to hear that. What is Islam's position on this? They are infested with, whether it be, it's not just sisters. Many people, when they talk about it, sisters. Brothers as well. They're infested with this idea of red pill, these ideas uh, I as a man have to be like that And I have to be like this And I can't marry this And I have to marry that She has to be like this Okay, but what about the, what the companions were doing then? How does that make sense? How does your argument make sense? Do you see what I'm saying here? I'm saying just make your ma'ayar Islam Make your guideline for everything Islam And you will be successful like that Wallahi you will be successful You will not regret it And if you speak to anyone who's sincere in this They will not regret when they made Islam their guideline. The problem is sometimes we, without saying it, we think we know better than Islam. Oh yeah, but we, you know, Muslim representation now, you know, we need Muslim boxers, female boxers, Muslim female athletes. What are you talking about now? How are you justifying a sister going to the gym, working out, squatting in front of the whole gym? She's squatting in front of the whole gym. She's doing all of these. These are actual social issues here. The sister will say, I need to be fit, this and that, whatnot. What are you talking about? Do you care what Islam has to say about this? Okay. And I'm saying this in the most, you know, I mean, you know, I could say in a better way. But look, we have to care about what Islam has to say about this. We have to. I think it's come to that stage where, where a lot of our feelings have come in and we dilute and justify along the way to just, you know, push our own narrative. Let me tell you what I think, right? I think one weak link in the chain of your ancestors breaks the strength of Islam. That's what I think. Uh, I've seen, you know, my ancestors, some of them, and I, I actually know them, I know their names, stuff like that. Some of them were scholars. One of my ancestors, he was in charge of 100,000 people giving them fatwa in India. Okay. These were great people. And one weak link now, if I'm a weak link, if I am a male or a female that is compromising my Islam by even going to gym, wearing leggings and squatting and doing all of these things, if I am that weak link and I'm not implementing Islam the way it should be, that's going to affect my children. They're going to become even weaker links. And when my children become affected, it's going to affect their children. And before you know it, Islam will vanish and perish out of your generations. And I've seen this with my own eyes. You meet some people, they say, my great, great, great granddad was so-and-so sheikh. What the heck happened with you then? <laughs> yeah? And some might say this is uh, the uh, end of times are coming and it's going to, it's, it's inevitable, it's going to happen and it's happening. This, this is why, brother, this is why I, I, I believe now more than ever, we have to stick to Islam. Like Islam, it reminds us of the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. Holding on to hot coal. That it will become like holding on to hot coal. Okay? Is it, is it not like that now? Yeah. Is it not like that now? Where This is what we're talking about. We, we have trials all around us. We have Muslim representation. We have this and feminism and red pill and liberalism. And we have, you know, Muslims becoming infiltrated with... They're becoming colonized. They think that, that their clothing is better than ours and this and that. You know when the British first conquered India... You know, there's a book called The White Mughals. The White Mughals, very interesting title by William Dalrymple. He's a historian. Why is it called The White Mughals? This is a book about essentially white people when they colonized India who were inspired by the Indian culture. They were inspired by the Indian culture. They learned Urdu. They started to speak Hindi. They started to speak Urdu, etc. They were inspired by it. They started, to, they started to dress like them, like the Indians. Okay. To the extent now we have certain words in the English language, like William Dalrymple mentions in another book of his, The Anarchy. 
he mentions how, for example, the word loot. Loot. You know, in Urdu, we say, yeah, loot gear, for example. Yeah. Loot. The word in English, looting. It comes from, that's the etymology of the word, right? Etymology of the word. So the point is, why am I speaking about this right now? I am saying that influence, influence, when you become mentally colonized, though, when, the, when, when, when we lost leadership, political leadership in India, and the British took over, okay, and they ruled India for around 150 years, okay, then we see racism coming out. Then we see the subjugation of the Indians. You people are lower than us. You are like this. You are like that. Your clothing is lower than us. Your language is lower than us. Everything you do is lower than us. And now we come to this stage where we have British people, British Muslims, who see someone dressed like me or wearing this hat or wearing a topi, wearing whatever you want to call it, and they say, that's backwards, brother. <laughs> you shouldn't dress like that. You shouldn't speak like that. You shouldn't say this. You shouldn't do this. They look at, and, and some, some of our behaviors feed this, by the way. Unfortunately So when you go to some of our areas You go to Whitechapel You go to East London And you look on the floor And you see chicken wings on the floor And you see pan on the floor And you see this on the floor You say brothers what the hell are you doing You're feeding this narrative That we are barbaric and backwards people And we need them When in reality We have the case of Daniel of Mole Very very shocking subhanAllah 12th century philosopher uh, English philosopher 12th century and I'll say this very quickly because I've been speaking for long. 12th century English philosopher who, tra who, who studies in, in, in France, Paris. When he studies in Paris, he is not impressed by, you know, their, their, their level of education in philosophy and arts, etc. He's not impressed. What does he do? He travels to Spain. Daniel of Molay, 12th century. He travels to Spain. He learns Arabic. He studies uh, Lugha with them in, in, in Spain. He translates... Many of the texts, he, he learns the, you know, some of the texts, they were very forward in their translations of the Aristotelian works, etc. He comes back to England, okay, and as a result of his travel, as a result of his travel to Spain, under the Muslims, learning under the Muslims, he comes back and he influences and he impacts Oxford University. Oxford University, who starts to implement some of the things that he came with. From Spain, from Muslim Spain. So the point is, when you realize as a Muslim what you're capable of with your knowledge, with actually being a proper Muslim, you realize, you realize that uh, that um, I don't have to be colonized. You know. Um, you're so right. We are mentally colonized. We are hmm? mentally colonized. I believe. I believe this. I believe this. Even I, I've spoken to brothers. Even sometimes in the da'wah, in the brothers who are responsible for. For propagating Islam They'll tell you don't wear this Don't wear these clothes Don't dress like this Don't speak like this What are you talking about brother Why shouldn't I wear this and speak like this Oh because you know uh, You're mentally colonized bro <laughs> That's what it is SubhanAllah um, I was watching one of your interviews on Talk TV Oh yeah Last night Okay. How did that come about? <laughs> uh, they just got in contact with me I mean Talk TV got in contact with me They've um, and I thought it's a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. I thought uh, it's a great opportunity, and it was it was at the heat of the Palestine issue. Um, you know, when it was, I mean, it's still in heat. Subhanallah, may Allah make things easy for them. I mean. But it was towards the beginning of the whole issue, and I thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity. So let me do this. So I prepared and uh, went for it, and I think it was a great w result. Were you afraid before you went in? I'll tell you something, brother, and I haven't, you know, that is doing things like that really, really develop you. And I think that's why people should do things that challenge them. They really challenge you. That was one of the most challenging things I've done in my, I've done in my life. And it's not, people may think, James, we, oh, that guy, Ash, I mean, what are you talking about, brother? They're not the most brutal, sharpest tools in the shed. Brutal, these guys. Right? No, but I'll be honest with you, they're, they're not the easiest, actually. I would much rather go, get, go up against Piers Morgan, probably, than go up against those guys. Because those guys are like, they, they speak to you like animals. They have they're no parameters. They have no journalism have no parameters. Limits. Yeah, They have no limits. They can say anything to you, Yeah. right? So you have to know you're going in with people who've got no principles in debate, right? 
it's 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 a street fight. Literally. Whereas Piers Morgan is more respectable yeah, in yeah, a way, you yeah. know. So um, no, but it's not because of that though that it was one of the most difficult. It's because look at the scenario that a person is in. And this is where I think people need to give more credit to people. Uh, not me. Forget me. But more credit to people who represent Islam on the mainstream, generally speaking. Yeah. Because you have to understand that when you go, it's a sensitive issue, Palestine issue. If I say anything wrong, Muslims are at my neck. Yeah. Okay. Not only that, if I say anything wrong, it actually has a real impact. These videos are getting hundreds and thousands, millions of views. Okay. Not only that. Okay. You're actually talking about you're talking about your brothers and sisters who are you know being massacred. There's so many sensitivities to this. You're worried about how people are going to respond. And then you're, you've got these two guys in front of you. And then you're walking into Rupert Murdoch's uh, talk uh, TV building, you know, uh, TV building next to the Shard. And from the beginning, it's in a way, I don't know if they design it to intimidate you. And then you've got to go and sit there, be confident, be articulate, put your points across in a correct manner. Not get angry. Not get angry. <laughs> Represent Muslims in a correct manner I had beforehand But one of the things my father said to me Is make sure you put the points across in a proper way Don't get angry Because it's going to make Muslims lose, look bad right? It's going to make Muslims look bad This is a big responsibility man It's not a joke You see. And by the way Behind those two presenters You've got producers in their ears like saying, Say this, say you've that You've got like say five, this. six producers in the room they only bring you in when it's your second, literally. I was And you have the, no earpiece in you your no ears to, to help you out. You don't know what they've said before. Yeah. You don't know how they've introduced you. You don't know you don't know how they how they've set up the context for you. It's 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 very difficult. You know, I was even at one point watching uh to, to know the context on the TV. They came and put the volume down. So look at the games. Sir, can you come and sit in this corner? Away from the TV. Look at look at what's happening here, right? I'm not joking. I'm not making this stuff up. Wow. A woman tries to shake my hand, right? I say, oh, sorry, I can't shake your hand. I had it in the back of my head now. This is, a war. This is like war. It's like warfare. I have it in the back of my head. They're going to raise that issue. And they did raise that issue. So this, is, this, is not, this stuff is not a, a joke. It's, all it's a not setup. a joke. After that, they did call me for other shows. They called me for Piers Morgan. Um, I refused that one because the topic... You, this is chess. The topic they called me for was a topic I was not happy in representing at all. I won't mention what it was, because that would be controversial as well. Okay, but I didn't want to represent uh, that topic. And I felt like if I go on that topic, I'll be completely on the back foot. So I refused that one. They called me for some other ones and stuff like that. And they call me to this day. Um, you know, they. I think, I think they have like a list. Once you make that list, they just keep calling you. So ultimately, yeah. it, for them, it's all about views as well, right? It's not really about 100%. journalism at all. Uh, I mean, of course, there's an aspect of journalism, but numbers, man. Like, Piers Morgan, how much did he benefit from the whole Palestine issue? Immensely. It made talk TV Immensely. famous. Bro, Piers Morgan has probably never had views like that in his life. And that's why and that's he got upset when Dilly Hussein said, we're going to boycott you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's probably never had views like that in his entire life. And he's, I, I exaggerate not, you know, the amount of high profile figures that he had the capability of bringing on, of course, because he had made a name for himself and stuff like that. But the views and stuff like that he got were, were and he was tweeting about it. He was tweeting about it. If you go on his channel, they're probably the most viewed videos, right? So there is that aspect as well. But that's where as Muslims, I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't really agree with the whole boycott thing. I didn't agree with it personally. The whole when Boy some cutting peers. yeah, I didn't agree with it because my philosophy is a bit different. My personal opinion on that is, um, I don't care about him. I don't care about him. I care about the fact that a million people are going to be yeah. watching this. Do you see? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. an opportunity for me. Yeah, it's an opportunity for yeah. us. I mean, people may have. The, I respect those brothers and whatnot. And Dilly's a friend and stuff. Were you sweating in the yeah. studio at that time when 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 Ash and um, James? <laughs> Uh, were coming at you No When it started Alhamdulillah Genuinely uh, I felt very comfortable actually Genuinely And that's Prior to it Obviously I was making dua And dua is the weapon of the believer I was making constant dua that Ya Allah When I'm there Just allow me to Have thabat You know Be steadfast And It's as if akhi, When I started talking I just felt uh, I 
I felt very comfortable. I felt like how I feel now. I felt no, no, very no. comfortable. I, I, you know, I, I watch some of these. Um, I, I I enjoy watching uh, those shows because it's good, man. You can see like what they're doing, and these it's guys good. have no morals or, or any or, or any parameters. I mean, so it's it's a very sad state of affairs, to be honest with you. Like this guy James Will, I found out afterwards that. Um, or I is he the same guy that was on on LBC before? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's had a, quite a, an illustrious career. Wow. I'd say like a. He's been in quite some big roles. When I went on it, my uncles were, you know, much older. Obviously, they're in their 40s and stuff. They were saying, we remember this guy when he was uh, on the radio and stuff like when we were kids. So um, They but, make yeah. themselves look quite dumb. <laughs> Is that on purpose? I don't know if they make themselves look like that or they are that. I mean, like the uh, Ash guy, he just like, you know, bounces, you know, between, you know, conversations. I don't know if it's an image. I, I think part of it is an image. I think part of it is like an act they do. But um, yeah, it's just it's crazy. Imagine like doing a Muslim show like that, where where you get to do that too. I mean, we're like fifteen years behind, bro. Yeah, that's the problem. You know, uh, in our media side of things, that's why YouTube is good, man. That's why the things like we're doing, what you're yeah. doing, I'm doing, and the brothers and stuff. That's why it's good because uh, it's it's fast forwarding, man. Like because uh, unfortunately, Muslims on a media level are years and years behind. Than on Muslims. Why is that? Like I, I don't I don't I don't know exactly what it is. I think like you got Islam channel that uh, that's quite good, but it's not on digital space. They're not really ahead on digital space, is it? Look, the thing is, like, I th I think that I think that it's it's this thing that we see ourselves in the shadows of the West. Mm. I actually think it's this. Always following. Yeah, always following and not being innovative. You know, I think that. And we have the capability of doing it. We have the capability of Our being... people are working in those places, those mainstream non-Muslim environments. You know, there's an... Exactly. And and they're in high positions. Yeah. You know, bear that in mind. You know, there's an analogy that one of the brothers was mentioning to me. And I think this is a beautiful analogy. You know, if you have an elephant mm. and that elephant is born into captivity with its, you know, legs being tied mm. and chained. When it even grows up and it's a massive elephant now, it's still, it's mentally captive, you know? It doesn't realize that with one kick, it can kill its captors. It can, it, can, it can deal with everyone. It can kill everyone. It doesn't realize that because it has been, it's a sleeping giant. It doesn't realize its capability. And I think the Muslims are like that. I mean, not saying that the Muslims should, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying, <laughs> you know, but I'm saying that the Muslims don't realize, I'm using the analogy to make the argument that, Muslims don't realize their capability. Yeah, that they actually that we can we can be and we have been at the forefront of technological advancement, academic advancement, political advancement. You know, uh, we have these things. We have Islamic politics, siyasa, sharia. We have you know academia. You know, the philosophers, even on a philosophy level, the philosophers that the Western people look up to today are from amongst them: Avi Ross, Avi Sina, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd. You know. Um, in the sciences, you know, you have Al Kindi, Al Farabi. You have these philosophers. So you have many, many names that we have. People mention Muhammad ibn Musa Al Khawarizmi, you know, and and all of these guys. But there's many more than these people. These are just a few names. These are a few names in 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 in, in an ocean of names. So we have to really realize our worth. I, I I really don't feel like I can emphasize this enough. And this comes through education. It comes from educating your kids. You know what's happened, bro, to Muslims? They've become, they're just chasing money now. And, you know, I don't mean to, you know, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> because I, you guys I, are in business yeah. and stuff like that and whatnot. And that's a good thing. No, But when you only chase money, yeah, you only chase money. Your kids, you know, Muslim kids, what are they becoming? They're becoming just doctors and they're becoming, uh, you know, they're going into finance and becoming accountants and stuff like that. Good. They're good careers. I'm not. Crapping on those careers. They're good careers. But when do you ever hear, when do you ever hear a Muslim father tell his child, I want you to study humanities, arts in university. I want you to do history. I want you to do politics. I want you to do, uh, you know, philosophy. For example, obviously when you're able to do it, <coughs> when you have some basis in, in Sharia and stuff like that. When do you hear that? These are known as, you know, academic subjects for a reason. They are known as arts for a reason because these things 
you know, it, it was the philosophers that drove, you know, actual political and sorry, social change, you know, many, many a time. So we need to think about these things. Yeah. Well, now these ideal situations. Oh, yeah. I mean, is there a bigger, wider context to this whole um, ideal offensive against, I guess, uh, Muslims predominantly? I think the far right, um, once again, is another issue. And it's a, it's an issue that's grounded, as I said, in misinformation. Um, and a lot of it is of racist nature. There's a lot of racism, you know, deep rooted within some of these ideas that some of these far right individuals push. For example, the recent rights we saw, what was the cause? The killing of these three white children, white girls um, who were at some Taylor Swift, you know, I don't know, party or something like this. And... <laughs> And uh, some deranged individual, barbaric animal, walked in and, and killed these three children. Of course, as Muslims, you condemn such a disgusting and heinous crime Absolutely. against humanity. Um, but these people used it for their political agenda. Somehow we end up talking about Muslims and we end up talking about immigrants when the guy is British. As in he's got nationality, so he's not illegal in the country. He's not even a Muslim, he's from a Christian background. So guys, why are we attacking a mosque for? It shows you something, it shows you a deep-rooted, foul, you know, problem within the far-right narrative, right? It shows you. Why are you attacking a mosque? Why are you attacking a random black guy walking down the street? Brown people walking down the street. And then they say we're against illegal immigration. So is everyone. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Who's for illegal Every immigration? Every country is against yeah. illegal immigration. Is the mosque for illegal immigration? No. Yeah, so what, what are you talking about here? Do you see? So uh, I think, as I said, that this is grounded in misinformation and, and it's very problematic. And as Muslims, what is our role in this? One of the biggest things is, I believe as Muslims, we shouldn't feed the narrative. I believe as Muslims, a lot of our behaviors feed this narrative, man. Like when you see some videos coming out of the behavior of some Muslims, um, I'm not blaming Muslims. Obviously, they, they are not to blame. I would be dalik. But I'm saying you have to do your part to not exacerbate the issue. Don't make the issue worse. You know, when you behave, uh, you know, and this is a societal deeper issue. You know, when, when they come and they see Muslim areas, being dirty when they come and when they see muslim areas smelling and it, it causes an issue for us it makes the issue worse it feeds their racism it feeds their narrative do you see what i'm saying so i think part of our role is to not feed the narrative don't feed the narrative do your bit educate yourself i remember once i done a live stream and uh, it was on tiktok and f f hundreds of far right people hundreds of far right guys ended up in the stream. I don't know why uh, where the algorithm took things, but and I remember, and I'm not, you know, but you have to show them. I'm actually an educated individual. I have been born and raised in the West. I'm a respectable man. I'm a respectable individual, uh, and I'm more respectable than you actually, right? So what are you talking about? It's 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 a big issue, bro. It's a big issue with so many nuances and dynamics that it's difficult to address in a small podcast. I mean, in a short segment of a podcast. But I think that there are a lot of a lot of issues. Uh, but I do believe that such individuals like Tommy Robinson and those who are who are responsible for making the issue worse, they should be held to account. And yeah, is it is it to do? Uh, some people say it's because Keir Starmer banned arms export to um, Israel and, and Israel is, is making a retaliation through EDL and causing uprising and chaos, you know, under Starmer's leadership. I believe people like Tommy Robinson definitely have some sort of link to Israel and the far right for some reason have some sort of link to Israel. I mean, Israel, the way they believe it, is a country in the Middle East. Um, so how does it make sense that you're doing protests speaking about anti-immigration and you've got alongside the English flag, the Israeli flag. How does that work? 
okay, uh, <clears throat> you know, why don't you have the Saudi flag? Like, it's another country in the Middle East. Like, what's what's actually happening here? So you can see there's 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 definitely some sort of there's something happening here. And I'm not no conspiracy theorist. I'm not one of those guys. I, <laughs> I'm not one of those guys. But you can see it's in front of you. Guys wearing an Israeli flag, waving Israeli flags. What is happening here? What's what's going on here, right? Um, very anti-establishment as they are, you know, uh, and they they, they they there's so many contradictions within them. This is one of the contradictions. Why are you waving a Middle Eastern flag? What you believe to be a Middle Eastern flag? I mean, uh, at, at, at a rally that's supposed to be, you know, arguing against immigration, would you be okay with Israelis moving to the UK? Would you be okay with that? You know, judging by your your actions, seems like you're in bed with them. Seems like you'd love that. Would you be okay with Indians? And the funny thing is, you have you, it's it's bizarre. The whole thing is bizarre. You have Indians supporting these guys. Some Indians, okay, um, they are referred to as Pajits online. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is um... I, I don't endorse. I don't necessarily <laughs> endorse this title, but you know, what's going on here? Right when deep down you know what these guys think of Indians, do you think these guys think good of Indians? No. So so, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's what do you think? You know, sometimes you not wonder. Like, do you not try and add two and two together? Like, what what is happening geopolitically? Okay, this guy. Okay, this is this might sound like conspiracy theory, but what's in your mind? Like, what are the dots that you see in your mind that connect to each other? I think that. The, I think, on a geopolitical level, it's very, very difficult to speak in absolutes, as you know. Um, politics is of that nature. But I think that Israel and the crimes that they have been carrying out on the Palestinians, some of the videos that you see to this day, um, just yesterday and the day before I don't watch these videos I try not to But I end up seeing them on my timeline um, On X and Instagram and stuff I think that The Muslims have been dehumanized I think brown people have been dehumanized I think that The narrative that the far right promotes Dehumanizes Muslims It paints Muslims as second class citizens and when you generalize, generalization is the beginning of racism. And racism is the beginning of dehumanization. And dehumanization is the beginning of genocide. There is a link between each of these things. And it's not a far link. So when you've dehumanized the people, you can kill them unapologetically. You can massacre them unapologetically. You can carry out a genocide and make it look like this is all justified. Look at what they're doing. You can do this. You can actually do this. And we've seen it happen in history. This is exactly what happened with the Jews. Okay. In Nazi Germany, they were dehumanized. There was propaganda against them. I was promoting, I mean, maybe you might want to bleep, bleep, bleep the name out because of, you know, whatever and stuff. But he was promoting, uh, you know, anti-Jewish propaganda. And we saw what that resulted in. The same thing is happening now. The same exact thing is happening now. Why am I mentioning this? Because on a geopolitical level, on an international level, we see the international community silent at the massacring of the Palestinian people. If those people were white people from any country, if that was Lithuania, or if that was Ukraine, or if that was any white country, it would not be like this. There would be outcry. If those videos were coming out of Ukraine, oh my God, there would be World War III. We would be in World War Three right now. So what's the issue here? I think these issues are really, really, really deep-rooted. And if you want to really know the, the actual background behind these things, the history uncovers a lot. The history uncovers a lot, subhanAllah. So as we know, Britain was directly involved in the establishment of Israel. Yeah. So they're already linked on a geopolitical level. Okay. America backs Israel. In fact, without America, Israel would not be able to carry out the massacre, massacres that they have been carrying out. Okay, uh, We have the far right in the UK 
which obviously in the grand scheme of these topics that we're talking about are small fishes, but they have their influence in the UK. We have them carrying Israeli flags and doing all of this. There is, um, unfortunately, uh, the world is seemingly becoming a very, very difficult place for Muslims. That's what's happening. That's so true because <laughs> not just in Middle East anymore, you know, where you live is Everywhere. becoming difficult. It's becoming, uh, Muslims are becoming ostracized from society. They are, they are actually being seen as second class citizens where you can easy, you can just, I mean, if you just go on some of these people's Twitter profiles, their ex-profiles, they can easily just generalize all Muslims by a few tweets. Mm. They, can, they can give you a crime and say, oh, it's the usual sub suspect. People see that, they're angered by that. They see a hijabi walking down the street, they attack her. Why are they so afraid? What, what are they afraid about? <laughs> I think Islam is a very, very powerful force. I think Islam, as an, if you look at Islam as an ideology, is a very, very, very powerful force. I think Muslims, um, as I said, are capable of a lot when it comes to technology, when it comes to education, and they are achieving a lot, actually. Muslims are achieving a lot. Some of the most qualified individuals in the world are Muslims. So I don't know if they are threatened by Muslims, by the you know um, progression of Muslims. I don't know if they are threatened by that. Um, but there are deeper things happening in front of us. And the problem is that we are in ghafla. Muslims are sleeping. That's, that's actually the reality. Muslims are asleep. And, you know, if we don't realize, you know, that we really need to... I mean, we have a big part to play in this society in the West. I'm not someone who's, you know... I believe that Muslims should be bringing maslaha to the West. We should be, you know, uh, be looking at the maslaha of the West. What do I mean by that now? Because I don't want my words to come across as if I'm anti-West. I'm anti, you know, uh, uh, people are going to ask the question, what, what, what are you doing here then? I believe the British people deserve Islam. I believe they deserve to hear about Islam. The da'wah efforts that we've been doing we're involved in da'wah because we wish good for these people we wish good for the british people right and people like tommy robinson don't like it but thousands and thousands and thousands of british people are coming to islam white Literally. english women are coming to islam white english men are coming to islam you know they are considering islam because they see even some of the fire right individuals some of them probably end up becoming Muslims. Why? Because what is the far, the far right believe in traditional values. They believe in traditional values. Islam has those traditional values. Islam has traditional values which is ground which are grounded in the belief in one God. Okay. The Sharia doesn't change. It doesn't change. It doesn't it doesn't mean meaning obviously the Sharia uh, you know uh, it, it, it um, facilitates for different times and spaces and situations but within itself it doesn't change right it's it's a consistent coherent law this is something very very attractive to people you know it's it's an established thing so i think that many of these people definitely some of the far right individuals they they they, they, they see that islam is changing the the dynamic here in the west and they don't like it Wow. They don't like it. And the more they try and suppress it, the yeah. more... I mean, it, it's quite counterproductive for them. Yeah, I mean... They're, in a reverse way, they're promoting Islam as well, with their hostility. Yeah, it happens. It, it always happens like this. When you are hostile against something, you pique the curiosity of people to look into that thing. And then when they look... How many stories do we have? Modern stories of people who read the Quran seeking to refute it, and they end up becoming Muslims as a result of it. So, and this isn't, these aren't cliche things that I'm mentioning. They can keep trying, you know, as Allah says in the Quran, يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ They wish to extinguish the light of Allah by their mouths. وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورِهِ And Allah will perfect His light. وَلَهُ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ 
right? Even if the disbelievers do not like this. That's what we are seeing before us. Sounds a bit crazy. Do you think these people are in touch with Dajjal somehow? Where um, Dajjal is directly <laughs> directing them like, do this, do this, do this, do that. And then, you know, because ultimately what Shaitan or Iblis, he doesn't know. I mean, Allah's got his own plans. Mm. But Iblis can make them feel like, you know what, this is the right way. I believe the Shaitan definitely has a role in these things without a doubt because of what the Shaitan's goals are for humanity. And many, many of us as Muslims, we speak about these issues as if the shaitan doesn't exist. Unfortunately, we take these things out of the equation. As for Dajjal, I don't know. <laughs> mm. um, I, 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 think, I think those type of things, I prefer not to bring those things into the equation because we don't have any evidence yeah. of these things. Do you see? We don't have, actually have any tangible evidence of that. Uh, but we do believe Dajjal is a figure. He will emerge. He will have significant impact, um, you know, amongst the people, as some of these individuals are having. And by the way, the effect of some of these ignoramuses, people who 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 can't spell, you know, frankly speaking, right? The effect, their effect on the people shows you how the Dajjal will, will, will affect people, you know. So I wouldn't say that the Dajjal is linked. But I would say that it's... The effects are <laughs> taking place. The effects of... Uh, preparation for him i don't think it's far-fetched to make the assertion that the, 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 this is a this is you know it's looking like he's close wow you know this is a very deep conversation man i mean yeah i'm, I'm loving it <laughs> yeah, 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 alhamdulillah yeah. um learned so much so much um what would you advise advise us so intelligent muslims mm. maybe living in the west yeah they may be working for a corporate, but they've got time in their hand. Mm. What would you advise them to do? I would advise them to see how they can use their skills and their intelligence and their, you know, the, the skills that they have to be become people who have utility for Muslims. How can you benefit the Muslim community? What can you do to benefit the Muslim community? Mashallah, for example, you're a businessman, you own businesses, etc., and you're still, you know, benefiting the Muslim community through this podcast method, for example, right? We all have our form of utility. You don't have to be someone like myself who my whole thing is this. You don't have to be like that. You know, especially a lot of people in the corporate world, a lot of people from that background, they have many skills that we need. They have many skills that we need. They use those skills to fill their pockets, but they don't use those skills, unfortunately, many of them, to actually benefit the Muslim community. So I would just say in a simple manner, think of how you can benefit the Muslim community because you can make a serious, serious difference, a serious change. You know, people, um, you know, if we look at history, this is exactly what happened with some of the the leading Muslim figures. You know, you know, like Muhammad Ali Jinnah, like the founder of Pakistan. I know that the history is very, you know, there's a lot of things to the history and stuff like that. But the point is that, that man... He was essentially, you know, an Englishman at one point, you know. He he lived amongst these people. He was a barrister for them. And he was a senior barrister, right? But eventually, there came a time in his life where he thought, what utility can I have for the Muslim community here, right? So, and there are many other examples like this. So you need to think about what you can do for the Muslims, how you can benefit, you know, um, for the Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, Ihris ala ma yunfa'uk, you know, work hard, be diligent for that which benefits, for that which benefits you. You know, so think about how you can benefit uh, the community. That's what I would say. Think the responsibility. I mean, we should all like yeah, take yeah. that responsibility on ourselves and think what we can offer. I mean, and the Jewish community is very good at this. Absolutely. The Jewish community. There's so was, much to be learned. I was shocked. Um, once I was sitting down in hospital, I don't know what I was there for, but I saw uh, <laughs> I saw these two these two Jewish guys walk in in uniform. They look like they're part of the ambulance, and I see a Jewish kid on the stretcher. So I'm thinking, how does this work? That can't be a coincidence. I saw something similar as well. So I look, uh, and I, what what intrigued me is that they're all wearing the kippah, right? Yeah. The the hat that they wear, and then I see it on the back of their uniform it says Hatzola. Yeah, which is their ambulance service. 
I'm like, what the heck is going on here? We're in we're in Britain, right? Um, so what's going on? And what what was going on is that they have their own ambulance service for Jewish people, right? So look at how how much progression that community has made. Um, you know, subhanAllah. So as Muslims, we, perhaps there there's there's a book out of their there's a page out of their book that we can take, you know. Um there's many things. Many Do things. you think these people, Jewish people, are more organized? I think so. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, this is my. This is this, these are these are the perceptions that we have, right? Yeah. When we look at them, they they come across more organized. They come across more. I mean, the results speak for itself, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. having ambulance service with your own Hebrew language. That doesn't I mean, come from a lack of organization, exactly, to say the least, yeah. right? Um, I think I think as Muslims. We we are very very focused on tertiary issues, you know. There's a very one of my favorite hadith, and I mention it all the time. I don't I don't mention it because it's the only hadith mm-hmm. I know. I mention it because I'm actually inspired by this hadith, where the Prophet he told us that Inna Allah Taala yuhibu maali al umur wa ashrafaha wa yakrahu safsafaha. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He loves for you to be involved in maali al umur, high matters, big things. وَأَشْرَافَهَا And the noble things وَيَكْرَهُ سَفْسَفَهَا And he dislikes for you the tertiary issues Issues that are tertiary Lowly issues As Muslims, we focus on lowly issues That's what we're best at We're best at We're best at arguing in the mosque about why the water is cold And why the AC isn't on And why the carpet is wet And why this happened and why that happened And that's what we love talking about And social about. media warriors. Social media and this and why did you say this And why did you say that we don't want to be united. We don't want to be united. We don't, um, you know, we look at another guy and we say that, oh, he studied here, therefore I can't unite with him for a benefit. And we still have, and many of the Muslims, they live on another planet. They live on another planet. They live, there's another planet, they live on that planet. Even when you go and you read, some of the British Muslims read their tweets and you read what they're doing. Brother, you don't realize where you're living. You need to realize what's happening around you. They're in a cocoon, shielded. Oh, but that cocoon is going to crack and they're going to realize. Wow. You know? SubhanAllah. Um, there's so much to talk about. I mean, I've got a whole list of questions, but yeah, um, yeah. I guess um, we don't have uh, we enough don't have time, sufficient time left. Yeah. Quickly, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Let's do Revert, it. brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. What support is there at the moment? Uh, is that adequate for, for the revert people coming into Islam? Yeah, I don't think there's adequate support. I don't think there's adequate support. I think that we could develop um, much more support for reverts. I've actually written a book, which inshallah I'm going to be releasing soon. It's called The New Muslim Guide. It's actually for reverts. Amazing. Um, because I noticed that there's 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 many books even out there. The books that we give a revert is this big. Yeah. So overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming. So my goal was to to write a book which you could give to a revert at the Dawa stall. And if they read that book, it's like 20, 30 pages. It will give them the fundamentals of Islam, right? So I think reverts need a lot of support. Some organizations are doing a very good job, you know. Um, but I believe, yeah, that we need to work harder to support I know reverts. there's an organization called Solace, but that's for mainly for revert sisters. Yes, I was going to say, I think it's yeah. for sisters, yeah. There are organizations in other countries as well. I've seen in Denmark, they have quite a good system. Amazing. Uh, some of the brothers there from the Diobendi background. That when someone becomes a Muslim with them, they teach them Hanafi fiqh and they start teaching them and stuff like that. It's amazing. Those guys are doing a great job over there. Okay. Um, And that's the point that we need to learn from these things. We need to implement some of these things here. I think Masajid should have, I think Masajid should really take this seriously. And I don't think they do. They should. I don't think they do, by the way. Like me, I don't feel confident to say to a river, oh, go and go to this mosque. And learn yeah. because I don't know what, what there is no earth. framework or infrastructure yeah. within the mosque. Exactly. So apart they, from the big ones, yeah, the big ones have something. Yeah. But I think we should establish these frameworks. That the, these are basics, man. Like we're not talking about the mosque should do. You know, and they lack in these things. All youth activities. Okay, forget that. But do your job as a mosque, where you're teaching people how to pray, man. Like you know, should have some river classes. Every mosque. Should have like a curriculum that's basic, very bare bones basic for reverts where they can come and learn basics of Islam. They can learn basics of uh, how to pray. All of these things should be present. 
Honestly, there's so much work to be done. And as, as you yeah, said, like, yeah, you know, yeah. we're just so interested in the petty little things and, yeah. you know, hating one on one another, you know, and dunya. Yeah. Dunya is definitely like, you know, dunya is good. Like, uh, personally, I think, like, as long as you include, you're inclusive with dunya, like where you have a greater purpose, where you want to do something else with the wealth that you accumulate. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. By all means. Let's invest in um, other Muslim startups. You know, that's something that we're so lacking. And we need that. We need that. And Muslims are stuck in this idea that they can't have money. We need that. We need that. You know, my grandmother, not that she's a reference in Islam, Allah Yarhamah, she used to say something. Money is like the blood in your veins. Absolutely. Right? What did she mean by that? She means, brother, whatever you want to do, you need money. You want to go for hajj, Even you need with money. dawah, like, you need, you money. need money. You need money. You need money. Money is... It fuels these things. And that's what the right? Jewish people have done so well. They've taken control of the yeah, money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they, they're definitely, many of them are very wealthy and stuff. But that's the point. As, as Muslims, you know, we need to really, really need to realize uh, these things. We need to get out of uh, these mentalities that have infiltrated. Individualism type of mentality. Not only individuals, some people have this false understanding of zuhud. You know, they believe that to to be to, to be a zahid is that you you don't have money. You're broke. <laughs> well, it's easier for a broke person to be a zahid because he doesn't have anything to do zuhud over. Right? And some people take it so far as you know, looking not presentable is oh, somewhat is... Uh, more religious and more pious. Mm, it, like not it not ironing your thobe or something. Like you know, it's more more religious or something. I mean, these are ideas that some people have, and 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 the thing is. We have to realize that as a Muslim, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "لا حسد إلا في اثنتين." There is no envy except in two things. The first thing he mentioned is a man who knows the Quran and he recites that Quran, etc. The second thing was a man who has money and he donates his money in the path of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is telling you this is a man worthy of envying. Right, and the envy is obviously ghibta, which is that you desire to have what he has without him losing what he has. But the fact that the Prophet is telling us that shows us something, right? Um, yeah, man, there's a lot of work to be done, but positivity is important, optimism is important. Um, you know, we don't want to just do a podcast talking about the problems of the Muslim community, optimism is important, be optimistic. Work towards solutions, Absolutely. be solution focused, and uh, you can achieve anything. You can really achieve anything. Honestly, yeah. you you really can. Um, I mean, in this, the part of the world that we live in, I mean, if yeah. you are not going to make something happen, then I'm sorry, you're Especially not going to make it. Of course. We're not in Bangladesh. We're uh, not in exactly. Pakistan. It's we're like, not in Somalia. Yeah, these people are like, oh man. Over here, you guys are examples of that. You know, we're all examples of that. Our parents and grandparents came into these countries as, as uh, you know, immigrants, uh, legal immigrants. <laughs> yeah. And they worked hard. By the way, these English people, they're also immigrants. Yeah. Then, then, then yeah, I mean, everyone's an immigrant, exactly. depending on how far back you exactly. go. But the point is that they made something of themselves, our ancestors. And um, it's, it's, you need to make something of yourself, you know. Uh, so, Yeah. It would be definitely, a waste. Def definitely, there's so much work to be done, but we should also remain optimistic and positive. Uh, let's end with a quick fire question. All right. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> Why are you, Android or Apple? Apple. Good. <laughs> no discussion about this. <laughs> what do you say? Do you have a message for Android users? Oh, man, you know, I would say, you know, good luck with your. Uh, with your blurry Instagram stories, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. um, your favorite Muslim speaker? Oh my God! My favorite Muslim speaker. I'm sure that's not, it's not going to upset. Like you know, if you don't pick someone else's name, just oh. say your favorite. It's an individual choice. I'm really. This is so difficult, man. My, my favorite Muslim speaker. Yeah, Allah. I have to give a name, isn't it? Um, Every name I'm coming to has got some problem with it. <laughs> so it's going to cause a problem. Uh, I'll say my father. MashaAllah. I knew, I knew that was I'll coming. That was uh, the safest I'll one. I'll keep yeah. it safe. <laughs> yeah. On, yeah. Um, I'm sure you have so many quote, quotes. 
oh, yeah. that you always relate to and you remind yourself of mm-hmm. what's the favorite one if it wasn't hadith or or quran a favorite quote wow apart from islamic ones i think there's a quote that i heard recently i just mentioned it that um one of the philosophers mentioned and he said that the the most cardinal sin the biggest sin and obviously we don't believe it's an islamic sin is not fulfilling your potential that's the biggest sin that you have a potential and you don't fulfill it well i think powerful that's a very powerful, powerful and one. the last one best country for hijra at the moment oh my god this is a big topic man <laughs> but i th- i think i think for hijra it depends on it depends on you mm. i don't think there's one country i think it depends on who you are i'm not like some of the, i believe online sometimes you hear some very irresponsible advice people don't consider that this is a nuanced discussion it depends on you mm-hmm. for you Hijra, the best place might be bangladesh yeah for me i actually believe the best place is pakistan but is that the best place for you do you see what i'm saying yeah. right is that the best place for my somali friend right yeah but he goes pakistan and <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. so i believe it depends on you yeah and what your where you're from where your circumstances are a lot of the times i believe the best place is probably going to be where you come from and last one yeah. this is a new addition favorite holiday destination oh i'm going to say i'm going to say japan i went japan recently wow next level i need to go you need, to, to, go. Go. You need to go you need to go you love it uh brother um thank you so much no problem at for all for coming in and facilitating this conversation i hope our viewers will benefit I hope so. and um if they have any questions i'm sure please keep an eye on our comments so generally people do ask questions and if you can you know chip in inshallah. it would be great inshallah inshallah definitely jazakallah khair jazakallah khair man assalamualaikum waalaikum assalam rahmatullah and that's it for today on side by side i hope you have found our today's conversation enlightening insightful and entertaining If you have enjoyed this conversation please do consider subscribing to our channel on the platform you are tuned into please share it with your family and friends and comment below if you have any guest recommendations or questions for our today's guest on the topics that we have discussed I will see you on our next episode until then stay safe Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh